Father, we hide ourselves in you. There's nowhere else we could go. We are sinners by nature, your children by adoption, uh, saved by grace, as we have just heard. And having lived in hostility against you, having been your former enemy, where else could we have gone but to you? To hide ourselves in you, to find covering from you, to find righteousness from you, by your grace, through the means of faith. And we are so grateful, Lord, for another Lord's Day. We have sung your praises. We have sought to encourage one another in conversation this morning. And we have heard in your word, and now we have an opportunity to open up your scriptures one more time to see your glory, and to see your greatness, and to worship you. Lord, nothing else matters in this moment that but that you would get the glory that you so richly deserve, and that you would get the glory in our hearts of humility, brokenness, and faith, that we would marvel at your greatness, that we would marvel at your promises, that we would marvel at the prophecy of who the Messiah would be to now know that they are fulfilled in Christ. And so, Lord, I just pray that in this time as your church, as we open up your word, I pray that you would indeed glorify your son this morning. Uh, this is a prayer that is the very heartbeat of your own character, so we know that with confidence we know that you will answer it. Glorify your son, Jesus Christ, in our hearts and in this congregation, we pray. Amen. All right, you may be seated. I'm going to invite you to uh, grab your Bibles and open up to Mark chapter 1. We're back in the Gospel of Mark um, I want to read the introduction to Mark. Mark chapter 1, verse 1 through verse 8. Mark chapter 1, verse 1 through verse 8. Mark writes, The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea was going out to him, and all the people of Jerusalem. And they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist, and his diet was locusts and wild honey. And he was preaching and saying, After me one is coming who is mightier than I, and I am not fit to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. This is a profound text. Unfortunately, it's not our text this morning. I wanted to read the uh, text that will hopefully be in a couple sermons from now, but I do need to explain to you why we're not going to be in Mark this morning. The very beginning of this introduction, Mark explains why his gospel is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and he explains that on the basis of the Old Testament. Notice in those next two verses, he says, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet. And so we have in front of us the statement that the Old Testament told Mark who Jesus was before Jesus even came. And that's a profound truth that we all must appreciate. I remember it was a few years ago, um, I read a book by a theologian, a professor of the New Testament, at Calvin College and Calvin Seminary in Grand Rapids, and it was probably one of the best, worst books I've ever read. It was so bad, I couldn't put it down. And the heresy was so overt that it actually got under my skin, and I've never been able to leave it alone. In that book, 
the author explained that the, the Christ that you read about in the Gospels is so different than the Old Testament said he would be that he's virtually, this is almost an exact quote, virtually unrecognizable from the Old Testament. Regarding the Gospel of Mark, he said, I began to wonder when I read the Gospel of Mark, am I reading Jesus about Jesus of Nazareth? Or am I reading Mark with a Jesus mask on? As if, how do you know if Mark's just not writing about himself and just calling it Jesus? How do you really know that you have the real Christ? And he goes on in that book to even say that what Jesus actually does in the Gospels subverts the Old Testament. And his point was simply that the only way you can really know Christ is not from the Scriptures, but by experience of faith. And he was nothing more than an existential with nothing to place his trust in. By dismantling the Old Testament, he dismantled the Christ of the new as well. Because the Christ of the new is told to be the Christ in the old. And if the Old Testament isn't clear enough to point out who Christ actually was when he came, then we couldn't actually know that Christ was the Messiah, that Jesus was the Christ. Mark, on the other hand, is absolutely confident. The Old Testament is patently clear. And he can begin his gospel quoting the Old Testament to say, here's the beginning of the gospel. Jesus of Nazareth, he's the son of God, just like it's always been said. So all that's left is to fill in the gaps of the historical details of Jesus' actual life. And it stands on the foundation of what the Old Testament said. And so in order to benefit from Mark, I thought, you know, better than just diving into the introduction, I think we want to spend a couple weeks doing some study of these texts that Mark points out are critical to understand his gospel. And that's going to actually make our discussion in Mark more efficient and more effective so that when we dive into Mark's gospel and we flow through it story by story by story, we will at least have had those three Old Testament texts mentioned in this paragraph. We'll have those fresh in mind. And so what I want to do this week and next week is look at the texts that are referred to in this quote. In verses 2 and 3, it looks like one Old Testament quote. In fact, Mark just introduces it by the prophet Isaiah. And that happens from time to time. Uh, sometimes there's, there's groups of prophecies that get put together because they're referring to the same reality. And sometimes New Testament authors will even quote from some of those tied or linked prophecies and then maybe just ascribe credit to one. And that's what happens here. We have three prophecies tied together in one quote and Mark just says, as it says in Isaiah. But properly speaking, there are three texts referred to here. Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, Exodus 23, verses 20 to 23, and Isaiah 40, verse 3. Now, the quote from Isaiah is profound. In fact, that's, there's a good reason why Mark only quotes from Isaiah. Of course, he is the most prominent, uh, one of the most um, popular, most well-known of the prophets, but also for Mark's purposes, the prophecy of Isaiah is so critically tied to his biography of Jesus Christ. I'm going to spend an entire exposition looking at that quote from Isaiah and what Isaiah tells us about the coming Messiah. So that's going to be in a couple of weeks. But I'm just going to take my cues from Mark. If you look at Mark chapter 1, verse 2, it, the first line of this quote says, Behold, I will send my messenger ahead of you. Now that is not found in Isaiah 40. That's found in Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. So, this morning we're going to turn a, quite a bit of our attention to Malachi 3 and quite a bit of our attention to the book of Exodus. So let's dive in at, back at Malachi chapter 3, last book of the New Testament. 440 years before, sorry, last book of the Old Testament. Thank you. I saw that. <laughs> I saw that correction. <laughs> Hear what I mean, not what I say. Um, the last book of the Old Testament, 440 years before Jesus walked the earth. And so here in Malachi, we have um, six prophecies. They're, they're pretty heavy hitting. It's kind of like Malachi takes the gloves off and he goes right at the heart of the people and starts asking them questions, exposing unbelief, exposing areas of of uh, infidelity, and his, his 
his approach is actually pretty similar. In each of these refrains or in each of these messages, he starts asking questions of them and he puts words into their mouth, not because they're not thinking them, but maybe they just haven't actually said it that way. Let me give you a couple of examples, just starting at the beginning of the book. Chapter 1, verse 2, I have loved you, says the Lord, but you say, how have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord, yet I have loved Jacob. So notice, he starts asking the questions that they are actually asking in their heart, whether they worded them with their mouth or not. That's the, that's the verbiage of their theology. Skip down to the second um, charge, the second prophecy in chapter 1, verse 6. A son honors his father, a servant his master. If I'm father, where is my honor? And if I'm master, where is my respect? Says the Lord of hosts to you, O priests, who despise my name. But you say, watch this, but you say, how have we despised your name? You are presenting defiled food upon my altar. But you say, how have we defiled you? In that you say the table of the Lord is to be despised. Now, no self-respecting Levite in Malachi's day would actually say, hey, let's despise the Lord and offer second-rate sacrifices. But they are offering second-rate sacrifices. And so he puts the verbiage of their theology on display right in front of them, in this case, twice. And he does that over and over and over and over again. Let's fast forward to the fourth prophecy. It starts in chapter 2, verse 17, and it goes through chapter 3, verse 6. Chapter 2, verse 17 to chapter 3, verse 6. This is where our quote comes from, and it's important to understand the context. Verse 17, you have become weir- I'm sorry, you have wearied the Lord with your words. Yet you say, how have we wearied him? And so the same, same approach, same tactic, same rhetoric. He brings the charge of the Lord against the nation, and then he goes ahead and just gives the nation their own words. And here the issue is, you've wearied God. You've wore him out. You're draining his patience. You're exhausting God. That's a pretty phenomenal thought to think about wearing God out. I, um, I can get wore, pretty wore out. I mean, sometimes I like, you know, I like exercise, you know, I like hiking or running or skiing or whatever, and I, you know, I enjoy some exercise, and that's kind of stimulating to a, to a point, and then maybe I can get tired. There's, there's one activity that really drains my patience and really wears, wears me out physically, and that is laundry. Whenever, it's, uh, whenever I sit down and then I come home from work and we put the kids down, I'm like, hey, you know, we have time to catch up. And then April breaks out the laundry. It's just like I feel my, weak, my knees get weak. They, I, they start to buckle. I kind of have a gag reflex. I try to get, I try to get, some, get some fluids and try to recover on the sofa. And, and I try to fold something. And I get about two things folded. And she's like done a whole basket. And then I'm scared to ask, is this, is this Miles or Derek's? I don't even know who wears this clothes. Oh, I don't know. I'm just exhausted. And I just get weary. And I think, nothing wears me out like laundry. (laughs) Nothing should wear the Lord out, right? I mean, what could possibly wear the Lord out? He is the God who does not slumber. He does not sleep. Isaiah says he does not grow weary. He has no limitation to his strength or his endurance. But here is an interesting passage. Here, the Almighty has become wearied because he's wearied by the words of his people. That's sobering. God, he's getting a reflex here, but it's a righteous reflex. It's a righteous exhaustion. Weary because his people keep saying, what are they saying? 17b, in that you say, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in him? Or, where is the God of justice? And so notice, there's really two main ways this is articulated. The first question is, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and and he delights in them. So obviously what this is, is it's this kind of thinking. The Israelites are sitting there, they're looking at the the situation around them, the the nation is corrupt, and they're looking at evildoers, evildoers are tolerated in the nation and in the land, and then you even have evil perpetrated by the pagan nations around them, and, and they continue on, and God just continues to accept them, tolerate them, 
put up with them? And so their inner monologue is this. I guess the Lord delights in them. Now, I don't imagine any Israelite would have written down on a piece of paper, give me your, give me your thought of God. What do you think he's like? I think he delights in evil. But certainly that's their theology expressed in verbiage because they do not have an explanation for why God just lets this continue. The other way, and, and I think this, the reason why this is worded second, this is probably the more common articulation. Where is the God of justice? Where's the God of justice? It's like life just continues on, wicked just keeps being perpetrated, and the evildoer continues to excel, flourish, get richer, no consequence. Where's the God of justice? God's getting worn out by these insulting kinds of thoughts that are so far below him and the nation is questioning him. They're questioning either his righteousness or his presence because this should not be. The questions that they're asking is really answered in the following prophecy, verses 1 through, through 5. But I'm going to create a little bit of attention in your mind. You've got God's people questioning his character in chapter 2, verse 7. Uh, verse 17, and if you skip down to the end of this prophecy, you have God saying this famous, probably one of the most famous verses in all of Malachi, I, the Lord, do not change, therefore you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. Okay, if I just bookended the, this prophecy, 2.17 and 3.6, and removed the guts out of it, Though the front and the beginning couldn't sound more opposite. At the beginning, God is actually being worn out, wearied by the words of his people. At the end, he says, but I don't change, so therefore you aren't consumed. And I'm thinking, well, God doesn't change. He's righteous, and he's going to judge sin, and his people are sinning against him. And so to hear that seems almost like it doesn't follow. It seems unnatural for God to have said chapter 3, verse 6. I remember one time I was in Africa, we were at this um, uh, lion uh, uh, park where they had several lions in, in these cages uh, from, the, from the, the safari there, and um, one of them was this male who was in his prime. He was about 10 years old, he was uh, apparently the son of some famous lion who acted in some movie recently, and so uh, we, we saw the, the son who was there, and we saw the actor, he was you know, kind of over in the convalescent center part of the park, and um, so the, the lion who was in his prime, he's out there, and they, have, they clearly haven't fed this guy because the, the guy who worked there comes out of the shack with this kudu drumstick, you know, a big African antelope drumstick, you know, like a 60, 80-pound drumstick. And as soon as he pulls this thing out of the shack, starts dragging it towards the, the cage of this lion, the thing just starts, it just goes right up to the fence and just starts roaring. And we are, I mean, it's just us and a chain-link fence and this 10-year-old male lion. And he is just roaring in our face. I am up against the chain link like this. I'm just like, wow, that is impressive. And he just takes that thing and starts getting it swinging and finally whew, throws it over the fence and he pounces on it and covers it like nobody's touching this kudu. And I'm thinking like, nobody's trying, buddy. Like, just <laughs> chill. Like, nobody wants that thing. And he starts chomping on this thing, just crushing the femur bone with his jaws. I thought about this verse. I thought about the connection. I thought, you know, if you put in front of a lion a salad or a kudu drumstick, pretty obvious which one it's going to pick. But to take 2.17 with 3.6, sounds, like sounds like saying, you put a, lion, a salad in front of that lion and saying, because I don't change, therefore I'm going to eat the salad. It doesn't make any sense without the middle of this prophecy. How is God's unchanging character the reason why this sinful people is not destroyed? That's critical. Chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, I'm going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me. And the Lord, whom you seek, will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. 
But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like a fuller's soap. He will sit as a smelter and purifier of silver. And he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver so that they may present to the Lord offerings in righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. Then I will draw near to you for judgment and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers and against the adulterers and against those who swear falsely and against those who oppress the wage earner and his wages, the widow and the orphan, and those who turn aside to the alien and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. Why aren't they consumed? (laughs) Because mark this. God is going to send a messenger who's going to prepare way before who? Me. God is coming. He's coming personally, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming. God is coming in person, and he is going to purify the people so that there is, among the nation of Israel, a pure generation so that he will not destroy the nation. This is a profound prophecy. It's so clear in verse 1 that there's um, two messengers. You see it there in 1a? Behold, I'm going to send my messenger. And then when you skip down to the second half of the verse, there's another messenger, the messenger of the covenant. So notice, the first messenger is clearing the way before me. Capital M, very appropriate, because Yahweh is speaking. And then the Lord, notice the second, uh, this, this, um, second half of this verse, it says the Lord, that's Adon, Adonai, uh, Lord or Master. And that's a divine person, the, namely the me who is referred to first person in, the, in, in 1a, the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. So there's a messenger preparing the way before God, and God, the Lord, is going to show up in his temple. And in true parallel fashion, Malachi parallels the Lord whom you seek coming suddenly into his temple with the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming. So what's interesting about this verse is that we realize this first messenger is preparing the way for the second messenger. The first messenger is making a clear access for this second messenger to get to the temple. And the second messenger is a divine me. And the second messenger is the Lord. And the second messenger is the messenger of the covenant. And so it's very clear that this prophecy is telling us God is coming personally to his temple, and then the rest of the prophecy makes sense. Who can endure the day of his coming? I mean, the faithful would be hoping for God to show up. They'd be hope, hopeful and anticipating the Messiah. But Malachi 3.2 says, but who could stand? Because the Messiah is coming, and it's going to be a, a terrible day. He's going to come, and no one can stand. Who could stand when he appears? He's like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He's going to do to impure metal what melting down and the, and the forge would do to, to impure metal. He's going to do that to the nation. He's going to do to dirt on, a, on textiles what the, the alkaline lye would do for the launderer. He's going to purify the nation. It's going to be a purging. And when he purifies the nation, he's going to sit as a smelter, verse 3, and a purifier of silver. And he's going to do that to the sons of Levi. He's going to purify the priesthood. He's going to refine them like silver and gold so that they may present to the Lord offerings in righteousness. When God shows up in person, he's going to purify the nation so that they could actually offer offerings the way it was originally intended. Then, verse 4, the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old as in the former years, and then and only then will he draw near to judgment. You realize, if if God were to show up on earth, and God were to bring the kingdom immediately, and to bring judgment, 
without this purification process, he'd consume everyone. The promise of the purification process is the only way, verse 6, can be true. For I, the Lord, do not change, therefore you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. Verses 1 through 6 are the answer, it's God's answer to the brazen and skeptical question of chapter 2, 17. That's how Feinberg worded it. That's exactly the right connection. There are other prophecies that talk about this. We could read dozens and dozens and dozens. One a good example would be Hosea chapter 3, verse 4 and 5. Hosea writes, For the sons of Israel will remain for many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or sacred pillar, without ephod or household idols. Afterward, the sons of Israel will return and seek the Lord their God, Yahweh their God, and David their king, and they will come trembling to the Lord and to his goodness in the last days. There was a prophecy that Israel will seek out God and David, the future Messiah. Well, we're here in Malachi chapter 3, and I don't want to I don't want to turn to anywhere else for just a second. I want to finish something in Malachi that's clearly part of this prophecy. Let's go to the end. Chapter 4, verses 4 to 6, are really a prophetic conclusion to all six disputations or prophecies. Malachi says in chapter 4, verse 4, Remember the law of Moses, my servant, even the statutes and ordinances which I commanded him in Horeb for all Israel. Behold, I'm going to send you Elijah, the prophet, before who? Now, this is interesting because you can see the parallelism with the prophecy of chapter 3, verse 1. Chapter 3, verse 1, I'm sending a messenger before me. Now, chapter 4, verse 5, I'm going to send you Elijah, the prophet, before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord, Yahweh. Verse 6, He will restore the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers so that I will not come and smite the land with a curse. So when you put 3-1 with 4-5 and 4-6, you realize, wow, this messenger of 3-1-A is Elijah or the antitype to Elijah. He's a prophet. And the messenger of 1-B, the messenger of the covenant, the Lord himself is in verse 4. Chapter 4, verse 5, Yahweh. Wow. A human prophetic forerunner before God shows up in person. This is a profound prophecy. In fact, chapter 4, verse 6 makes it clear that the conversion of individuals will be the precursor to God fulfilling these promises to the nation. And so the national salvation is tied to an entire generation of individual converts, according to verse 6. So far, so good. But I'm afraid that we're still missing something. This is such a profound prophecy, and there's so much to it, because there's so much that's come before it, and my fear is that we could miss something just for lack of familiarity. Um, I, I appreciated the story of a um, Ricky Watts, who was an Australian, and so all of our Aussies. Uh, Daniel Bruce will appreciate this illustration. Maybe I don't know how many other Aussies there are in the in the in the bunch here, but uh, he came here. Uh, Ricky Watts did. He came here from Australia and he began studying in in the, in the states. And he said that he he kind of marveled as several times in his in his lectures, as he sat in under, under lectureships, he would hear um, professors and theologians uh, referring to this phrase four score and seven years ago. And then he kept hearing, he kept looking around the room, and he said it seemed like everybody else was like in this knowing category, like, oh, yeah, yeah. And he's just kind of like, could, didn't get it, of course, because he's never probably even studied the Gettysburg Address, probably never heard of it. And so I, I, like, I like imagining how that went, you know, maybe at some lunch, talking to his, to his classmates. Say, hey, guys, uh, you're, all, you're all Americans. What, what happened 87 years ago? I don't know. 
you know, because he probably, this is probably like a late, late 80s. And they're thinking, turn of the century? I don't know. I mean, I don't, what, what, what's the, why? I don't even know what happened 87 years ago. What are you talking about? You don't know what happened 87 years ago. That phrase continues to get thrown around and everybody's heads are nodding like in agreement. What kind of, what kind of cover-up's going on here? <laughs> and so some of you have to explain, where did you hear it? Well, the professor said four score and seven years ago. Oh, Gettysburg Address, 87 years after the uh, independence of our nation. And so he's pointing out that these people shouldn't die in vain because we, you know, and this is why this may be a national cemetery. All, okay, got it. And there was a context. The words were rich beyond what Ricky Watts understood because there was a heritage to them. And that's maybe similar to what's happening here in Malachi chapter 3. There's something rich happening here. In chapter 3, verse 1, Mark's very aware aware of it. So keep your finger in Malachi 3. Let's go back to Mark for a second. Uh, Do you notice what what seems to be, maybe at first glance, inaccurate? Is this an inaccuracy? Did Mark make a mistake quoting Malachi chapter 3, verse 1? So keep your finger in Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. Go back to Mark chapter 1, verse 2. Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. Now go back to Malachi chapter 3. Behold, I'm going to send my messenger and he will clear the way before me. Whoops. Oh, I must have copied it wrong. Wait, let's just look one more time. No, it says you. Yep, it says me. And there's a rich heritage here. Paul, Mark, of course, made no mistake. This is very deliberate because this is by no means the first time the Old Testament has talked about the angel of the covenant. The messenger, the Hebrew word for messenger, malak, is messenger or angel. And there's a rich heritage of that, of that term and of that identity. In fact, one of the most profound um, use, uh, examples of that is in Exodus 23. Exodus 23, I'm gonna, I want you to turn here, and what we're going to have to do with the rest of our time is we're going to jump around a little bit, mostly in Exodus and Genesis, because I want to show you some of the heritage that comes to the mind in Malachi. Malachi's mind as an author and Malachi's audience as listeners, they would be hearing this prophecy thinking of this kind of, this kind of familiarity. It would be like, Four score and seven years ago, you're not thinking what happened 87 years ago, you're thinking Gettysburg Address. So when Malachi is speaking to his audience and he mentions messenger of the covenant, they're thinking of the messenger of the covenant as revealed in the covenant of Moses back in Exodus 23. Turn in Exodus 23, verse 20. And now you'll see why Mark words his quotation the way he words it. Here's where our pronouns come from. It was no mistake at all. It was a direct quote from the Old Testament. Exodus 23, verse 20. Behold, I'm going to send an angel before you to guard you along the way and to bring you into the place which I have prepared. Oh, there it is. Fascinating. He takes Malachi 3, 1. He takes the pronouns from Exodus 23, verse 20, because they are the same prophecy. And he puts them together in his quote deliberately for the reader to show us there's a thread here that needs to be tied so that we can appreciate the story of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. It's critical. So let's look at verse 20 to 23. These four verses are really, really important. Notice, well, let me just read the four verses and I'll 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 make four quick observations because we've got a lot of work to do here. Verse 20 to 23, Behold, I'm going to send an angel before you to guard you along the way and to bring you into the place which I have prepared. Be on your guard before him and obey his voice. Do not be rebellious toward him, for he will not pardon your transgression, since my name is in him. But if you truly obey his voice and do all that I say, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. For my angel will go before you and bring you into the land of the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, and I will completely destroy them. 
The word angel in verse 20 and the word angel in verse 23 are both the same word translated messenger in Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. It's the same word, angel slash, slash messenger. In English, they, they can have a kind of a radical connotation difference. In Hebrew, it's just the same word. They just That's the same function. Uh, messenger, angel, same thing. And so here, I want to notice four things. First of all, most importantly, this is angel, this messenger, is the Lord's messenger. Notice, it says in verse 23, my angel, my messenger. This angel slash, slash messenger belongs to Yahweh. He is the angel of God, the angel of the Lord. And both titles are used of this individual, this divine individual. And he's revealed in this covenant right here given to Moses. The covenant made with Moses begins in Exodus 19. And so, not surprising that four chapters in, you have this messenger that belongs to Yahweh, who is then called the angel of the Lord, the angel of God, or the angel of the covenant. Uh, those three titles you'll see all the way through the Old Testament. It's the same person. It's this person. Secondly, notice that the role is getting Israel to the promised land. Verse 20, I'm going to bring you, guard you along the way and bring you to the place which I've prepared. Verse 23, uh, I'm going to bring you to the land of the Amorites and all those other nations. So the role of this individual is getting the nation to the promised land, which involves two things. Verse 21 and 22, it involves Israel's listening to his voice with obedience. The second thing that it involves is his functioning as an enemy to Israel's enemies, in verse 22, and an adversary to their adversaries. So his role is getting Israel to the promised land and getting them there in such a state that they actually obey his voice and protecting them from every enemy. That's his role. Number three, incredibly, this messenger and Yahweh have the same name. Look at verse 21. He will not pardon your transgression since my name is in him. My name is in him. God goes on to say that he doesn't, God doesn't, he forgives iniquity, transgression, and trespasses, but he by no means will let guilt go unpunished. So he, does, he is a forgiving God, but he has never, never has, never will let sin go unpunished. It will always be punished. And here, this messenger of Yahweh has the same name, the same essence, the same character. The messenger of the covenant has the same name, character, and essence as Yahweh himself. Fourth, this messenger and Yahweh share the same voice. Look at verse 22. But if you truly obey his voice and do all that I say. Did you hear it? You, I, I, I would gladly appreciate if you truly obey his voice and do all that he says, or if you truly obey my voice and do all that I say. But he just flops it right in the middle, just flip-flop. If you truly obey his voice and do all that I say. His voice, all that I say. Yep, same thing, equal sign. This individual has the same name, the same character, the same essence, the same words, the same message as Yahweh. And yet, a distinct person, because he can be sent by Yahweh. Wow. This divine person is, of course, the Christ. This divine person shows up all over the Old Testament. And we could go further down the line. You can trace it all the way through the 50 plus times that it's used in the Old Testament um, from here on down. You can go forward and even trace it in retrospect. You can go back all the way up through Genesis and look for the angel of the Lord, the angel of God. And then occasionally, in, in further down the line, the angel of the covenant, as we saw in Malachi 3. Um, let's just show you a couple of examples here in Exodus. And uh, some of this is, uh, if this is fascinating for you, I'm going to move kind of quick. But we did talk about this in an equipping hour um, last year, so you can go back and pull that up if you want. But in Exodus chapter 13, there's this reference to um, the Yahweh actually uh, taking up his position, his presence, in the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. So look at Exodus chapter 13, verse 21. 
It says, The Lord was going before them in a pillar of cloud by day to lead them on the way, and in a pillar of fire by night to give them light, that they might travel by day and travel by night. Okay, so who's in the cloud? Who's in the fire? Yahweh. Skip over to chapter 14, verse 9. Uh, sorry, verse 19. Chapter 14, verse 19. Here it is. The angel of God, who had been going before the camp of Israel in the pillar of cloud and fire, moved and went behind them. The pillar of cloud moved from before them and stood behind them. Why? Because Israel's adversary is behind them. He's been leading them the whole way, but now the military of Egypt is coming to wipe them out. And what's the role of the messenger of the covenant, the messenger of Yahweh, the angel of God? His role is to get them to the promised land and to bring about so that they actually obey God's voice. That's his role. The enemy's behind him, so Yahweh moves behind him, i.e., the angel of God moves behind him. And of course, that's why Paul says that Christ was in, in Exodus and he was the spiritual rock. He wasn't the actual rock. He was the spiritual rock, Paul says. And he followed them because he did. It's a distinct person from Father God. And this just starts to blow our circuits when we start connecting these dots, biblical themes, to Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Because when Mark says, oh, let me tell you the story of Jesus of Nazareth, he knows that that person's story, his, his humanity started uh, very recently from Mark's perspective. But that person's story has no beginning. He is the Son of God. He is the angel of Yahweh. He is the angel of God. He is the messenger of the covenant. The one who's going to come suddenly into his temple. The one whom Israel is longing for. That's him. That's Christ. That's Jesus of Nazareth. Now, let me just give you a couple more here in Exodus. Let's turn over to Exodus chapter 3. And here's, here's one of the most um, staggering stories about the angel of the Lord. We pick it up in chapter 3, verse 2, and there you see the phrase, the angel of Yahweh. That's the most, by far and away, the most common label for this individual. Um, it's more common than angel of God, and it's, it's, it's much more common than um, angel of the covenant or messenger of the covenant. The angel of the Lord appeared to Moses in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, yet the bush was not consumed. So Moses said, I must turn now aside and see this marvelous sight, why the bush is not burned up. So the Lord saw, when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Now, we're three verses into this story. And we know that the angel of the Lord is a divine person. And Moses is writing this story. And Moses says, so the angel of the Lord was in this bush burning. And God said to me from the bush, he doesn't even flinch. Of course it's God. He has the same name, the same essence, same character, same voice, same message, distinct person. So God is now speaking to Moses, specifically the angel of the Lord, the, as we would know now, the second person of the Trinity. Skip down to verse 10, Exodus chapter 3, verse 10. So now therefore come, and I will send you to Pharaoh, so that you may bring my people, the sons of Israel, out of Egypt. Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh, and that I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, certainly I will be with you, and this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you, when you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God at this mountain. And of course, they're at Horeb. And they, he's going to come bring them, the entire nation back to this mountain to give them the law and reveal himself to the nation. And that's going to be the sign that Yahweh God, i.e. the angel of the Lord, i.e. Elohim God, i.e. Yahweh, i.e. angel of the covenant, is actually doing it. Moses is a Staggering under this prospect. Just imagine barging into the uh, capital of the world's greatest superpower and demanding that 
he lets all of his slaves go free. Moses is like, ah. So verse 13, then Moses said to God, Behold, I am going to the sons of Israel, and I will say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say to me, What's his name? What shall I say to them? I mean, he's just thinking like, Are you kidding me? Like, what kind of... What kind of certificate am I supposed to show? Like, proof of authenticity. No, no, really. It was a really cool experience. You should listen to me, guys. Come on. Let's, let's leave. And you might get killed. Follow me. He knows how that's going to go. God said to Moses, verse 14, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Now, that's kind of an intriguing answer at the least. I am has sent me. So imagine the Israelites saying, hey, who's this guy showing up? to some, some Jew who ran off like 40 years ago, and he's telling us to like, leave? On what basis? I am. I am has sent me. Okay. It can sound kind of um, maybe obsolete, kind of um, just mystical, almost just it's so undefined. Like, what's the significance of that name that would have resonated with the nation? Well, names in the Old Testament are almost entirely significant based upon their first usage. You know, if you have um, a name given in Hebrew, often at the very first time, it'll give you, like in the NAS at least, it'll often give you like a footnote explaining the meaning, you know, so here's his name because he did this, and so that becomes his name, or this, this happened at this location, so that becomes its name. So, you know, we talk about locations, Massa and Meribah. That's where in Exodus 17, a tragic showdown happened where they put God to the test. Testing and trial are the Hebrew words Massa and Meribah. That becomes the name of the location because the event was so significant. In Psalm 86, we call the Valley of Baca the Valley of Baca because it means tears. And so there, were, there was mourning in the Valley of Baca, so that becomes the name of the valley. Well, the, the, the same is, is no different here. The name of God. In verse 14, he says that my name is I am who I am. And then in verse 15, he says, so go tell them that Yahweh sent you. Notice in verse 15, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever. This is my memorial name to all generations. And at the very beginning, when he says Yahweh, you can see the all caps. L-O-R-D, all capitalizations, that's the Hebrew word Yahweh. In verse 14, this second divine person, the angel of the Lord, uses a different word. And it wouldn't sound like Yahweh, it would sound like Ehya. Ehya. You say, what's the significance of that? Well, the significance is quite important, actually. The significance comes from the Hebrew word to be. And it's an imperfect tense. Um, you could literally translate it, I will be who I will be. Okay, you're still saying, well, I'm not sure the significance of that either, John. That's not quite helping yet. Well, this is an interesting play on the divine name Yahweh. Yahweh is the, the name for God, and it comes from a root that means he will become. He will become. And so before we finish this thought in Exodus 3, let me do another cross-reference. You guys are doing great, by the way. Continuing to flip and flip pages here. We're going to do it a couple more times, so stick with me. Let's go back to think about this name Yahweh, and let's go back to its beginning, back in Genesis chapter 4. You think, well, if you're a discerning reader of the Old Testament, you might have thought I made a mistake there. Yahweh, first use in Genesis 4? Well, not first use in the Bible. Obviously, Moses uses it of God, the Creator, all the way through Genesis 2 and 3. Um, he use, uses it about 20 times. Um, but the first historical use of the word Yahweh is Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. It's the first historical recorded use of the name Yahweh. Um, if, there, if it was used before this, we don't have a record of it. This is the first recorded use of God's name Yahweh, and it's on the lips of Eve. Chapter 4, verse 1. Now the man had relations with his wife Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain. And she said, I have begotten a man-child 
with the help of the Lord. Now, this is the recording of the first birth, the first human birth in the history of mankind. And Adam and Eve have Cain. And then she makes this interesting statement, I've begotten a man-child, so that makes sense. They had a son. But what's interesting about it is this following phrase, and you'll notice it's translated, with the help of the Lord. And, and I'm, if you're reading in NES, which is what I have, there's italics on the help of the Lord. And of course, that's an expansive translation trying to help understand what's, what's happening here. And there's, there's, there's some debate about what, how this should be translated. Basically, to make it simple, there's, there's really three ways this could go. It could be a preposition, which would be with. I've begotten a man-child with the Lord. And the idea is with God's help or with God's intervention, we, we had a child. God was the cause, and so she would be ascribing credit to the Lord. Um, the, the, the other way it would be a direct object marker, but in this case, it doesn't work because we already have one. I have begotten a man-child, so there's our direct objects. That, that option doesn't even work grammatically. The third option is what's called uh, apposition. So now, you're, now I'm really asking you to nerd out with me here for a second. So put on your nerd glasses. We're going to push them up high on, our, on the bridge of our nose. What does apposition mean? What in the world is that? That's when an author renames something. So if Eve were just renaming who she begotten, you, you could use this mark, this, this grammatical structure in Hebrew would be one way you could do it. And that would be, I have begotten a man-child, comma, and just renaming it, Yahweh. Now, that sounds strange if you've never thought about that before, because that sounds like, man, she's, she's, she's calling Cain God? Think about, think about her context. What just happened? The fall. What happened as a result of the fall? A promise. What was the nature of that promise? Look at Genesis 3.15. Speaking to the serpent, verse 14, he says, I will put enmity, verse 15, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, you shall bruise him on the heel. This is a profound promise. And lest we become too familiar with it, it's called the first gospel often, appropriately so, but lest we become too familiar with it, let's just look at those first two phrases. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. Think about the nature of that promise. When God is speaking to Satan, to the serpent, right here in Genesis 3, 14 and 15, are, are Satan and man at odds with one another? Or are they allied in their hostility against God? Think about that. Mankind has joined with the serpent in rebellion against God, and God says, I promise you, I'm going to put animosity between you and you. Two parties that right now, as he speaks it, are allied in their hostility against Yahweh, and he says, I'm going to, I'm going to drive a wedge between you, which is going to require him to, to redeem one party, to save one party, and to restore them back to a relationship with himself. Because as he speaks that promise, both parties hate him. And how's he going to do it? Through Eve's seed. Through Eve's seed. So here you are, Adam and Eve, the only humans who knew a perfect creation, sinned and fouled it all up. The earth is subject to the curse described in the remainder of chapter 3. Relationships are severed. Mankind starts seeking self, distrusting one another, taking advantage of one another for selfish gain, corruption and sin in every form and fashion, natural disasters, disease, crime, all of it, result of the fall. And worst of all, mankind is enslaved in hostility against Yahweh, their God, formerly a friend, now an enemy. And God says, I'm going to reverse all that through a man to come. Eve, Adam, have a baby. Eve says, I've begotten a man-child, and then he inserts this first time, historical first instance of that phrase, Yahweh. The etymological or the, the meaning of that word, if we didn't just think of the divine name, would be, he will become. He will become. That's the Hebrew significance of the name Yahweh. 
Now, she was wrong. Mark my words, she was wrong. She found out by the end of the chapter. He didn't reverse any curse. He perpetuated it. What happened? More children, more children, more children. More generations, more generations, more generations. Read the genealogy of Genesis 5, and he died, and he died, and he died. Death was not reversed. The curse was not reversed. There's no righteous seed who's overturning the work of Satan. But her hope was right. Her hope was right. I think he's going to be the one. There's going to be a son who's going to reverse the curse and restore mankind. God uses this name of himself as his covenant name, Yahweh. But let's go back to Exodus chapter 3 now. And he uses the a cognate word, a very similar word, Ehiah, which means I will be. If Yahweh means he will become, Yahweh means I will be. The angel of the Lord is here joining a first-person connection to the covenant name Yahweh of verse 15 with the first person name of verse 14, I will be. I will be whom I will be, which is a great translation. That's exactly how Robert Alter translates it. He's a Jewish scholar. He translates it that way. This is the second person of the Trinity profoundly making a play on the name Yahweh, saying, I will be the one committing himself to be the one who reverses the curse, committing himself to be the one who will be born of a woman, born of a seed. Now fast forward from Genesis 4 and what Eve knew to Gen- Exodus 3 and what, Exodus, uh, what Moses knew. Now he already knows that seed promise has been expanded and narrowed to Abraham, then Isaac, then Jacob, now Judah. And he also knows that it goes beyond just individual salvation to a land promise and a nation and a people. And the second person of the Trinity says, I'll be the one. Make sure you tell them, Moses, second half of verse 14, then you shall say to the sons of Israel, say, I am or I will be has sent me to you. Tell them that. regardless of whether any individual in the nation believed it or not, is not the question. What we know is what's revealed before this event so that we know what they should have believed, what had been revealed. This is just a profound reality that the second person of the Trinity, right here in the burning bush, is revealing himself to be the one who would accomplish all of these redemptive purposes. But wait, there's more. Give me one more reference in Exodus, okay? We're going to wrap this up. Exodus chapter 6. Exodus chapter 6, verse 2. God further spoke to Moses and said to him, I am Yahweh, and I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty, but by my name, Yahweh, I did not make myself known to them. Wait a minute. 20 times Yahweh occurs in the creation account. And the first historical instance was uh, Genesis 4.1, and then God uses it of himself all the way through the book of Genesis with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? What is going on right here in chapter 6, verse 3, that God can turn right around and say, well, but this is my covenant. I didn't make it known to them that way. Because the significance of the name Yahweh, he will become has not yet begun to happen until God, the angel of the covenant, brings the nation out of the land to start to fulfill his redemptive purposes. It's not that they didn't know the name, that they didn't know the epitaph, that they didn't know the label, that they didn't know those four Hebrew letters. They didn't experience the beginning of that redemptive accomplishment. Moses' generation did. Wow. You start looking at the the threads and you realize, man, no wonder, no wonder this angel of the Lord shows up and protects the nation from external enemies. Like in Numbers 22 with Balaam, he was an enemy and an adversary, so the angel of the Lord shows up as an adversary against Balaam. 
No wonder. Faithful David. Now fast forward, getting closer back to Malachi. David, the, the seed promise is narrowed through David, and so now he knows this redemptive promise is in my line. It's one of my descendants. So enemies of David who would have killed him would have threatened God's redemptive purposes. So he, in Psalm 34 and Psalm 35, would cry out to the angel of the Lord for deliverance. It's not because he doesn't want to be bullied and he's calling out to God to deliver him. It's because he knows God's fidelity rests in his passing on the seed promise to another son to reign on the throne. And those conditions on the Davidic covenant have to be fulfilled. A son who doesn't need chastening, a son who is righteous, a son who will offer up his life as a burnt offering, which we'll get to next week in Isaiah. But you fast forward to Malachi. The angel of the covenant is this divine person who's already sworn, I'm going to become man, I'm going to fulfill the seed promise, and I'm going to reverse the curse. And Malachi says he's going to show up suddenly. Suddenly. Blink of an eye, snap your fingers, type of quick. He's going to just suddenly, he's going to be in your temple before you know it. And I'm going to send a messenger to prepare his way. No wonder Mark begins his gospel there. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this prophecy. Thank you so much for the Old Testament. Lord, even though we really only had time to look at two prophecies, it seems as though it summed up and tied up all the Old Testament into one complete whole. And Lord, that would be accurate to say that everything in the Old Testament is, is fulfilled, has been fulfilled, or will be fulfilled in the person of your Son. And we are so thankful to be able to see the glory, your glory, Lord, in your Son. God the Father, we, we pr- cry out to you as our God and our Father, Lord Jesus Christ, we cry out to you as, strangely to say it, our brother, the angel of the covenant who, who saved us to make us your brothers so that we could become your father's children, if that were even possible, and it is, because your Bible says so. If we just stagger, Lord Jesus, to think about the privilege of even praying to you, of even knowing you. We stagger because it's just... It just seems like so much condescension to anticipate what happens in the book of Mark, knowing that this was you all along, and then that you took on humanity at a point so that you could become Jesus. You were always the Christ. You were always the Son of uh, God. You were always the angel of the covenant. You were always the angel of the Lord, but you became Jesus. And so no wonder... Mark has to begin his gospel with a quote from those prophecies. And Lord, um, we'll even see it again. I pray next week, Lord, I pray that you bring us back here so that we could study the book of Isaiah with with a singular goal in mind, to prepare our hearts for for Mark. Because Mark has so much to, to teach us so that we would be ready to benefit from the gospel of Mark. And so Lord, we just we just can't help but thank you for your promises. Thank you for the clarity of your word. Thank you for showing us your glory in Christ. In your name we pray. Amen.